years ago today. In February 1836, as the Mexican army descended upon the Alamo, Colonel William Barrett Travis sent out that plea for help. The plea was answered by 32 brave men from Gonzales, riding through enemy lines to join the woefully undermanned garrison. Today, 32 men from Gonzales answered the call again to come to our aid in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character. We remain grateful for the brave men who entered the Alamo all those years ago, and with that gratitude comes the somber truth that the men never left. Today, you'll hear from several people who hold this history dear to their hearts. One such figure is Dr. Bruce Winders, historian and a longtime steward of Alamo history. Please welcome Dr. Bruce Winders. It's such a beautiful morning, isn't it? One of the things as a historian I've, I've developed over the years is the awareness of historical events, their space, and their place in time. And we talk about Gonzales a lot. We talk about the come and take a gun. We talk about the immortal 40, or 32. But um, just to put the things into perspective, Texas, when we talk about Texas, we're actually talking about in 1835, 1836. We're talking about the state of Coila and Texas. That's the political designation within what had been the Mexican Federation. Gonzales was named for the governor, the first governor of Coila in Texas, Rafael Gonzales. And it's in the department of Brazos. There are two other departments in Texas, the department of Bejar and the department of Nacogdoches. So those are the administrative um, units. Location. Location is key to everything in history. It's situated between San Antonio de Bejar and San Felipe. It's 90 miles to San Felipe from Gonzales. It's 70 miles from San Antonio de Bejar. It's 65 miles to Goliad. It's 50 miles to Mina which you probably know as Bastrop, and it's 120 miles to the coast. So it's fairly centrally located, which helps its role in the Texas Revolution. So what was Gonzales like on the eve of the Texas Revolution? The town was reestablished in 1832, and I say reestablished because it had been established, but the settlers moved to the coast after an Indian raid and in 32 they moved back. The town is laid out by James Kerr who later's name is given to Kerrville in Kerr County and Bird Lockhart who later becomes an Alamo courier and musters in the Gonzales 32, the Gonzales Changing Company. Titles to the town are issued by Jose Antonio Navarro, a resident of Bejar. So all these things are connected. Although they're different departments, there's an interconnectedness that is at play. They have an ayuminito form of government, which is the Spanish slash Mexican form of government with an alcalde who's a mayor slash judge, a councilman, a lawyer, a treasurer. So the town has its own government, of which in 1835, Andrew Ponton is the colleague. Almonte, Juan Almonte, in his review of Texas in 1834, says that the population of Gonzales is between 700 and 900. Now, not all of those people 
live inside the town. But that's how many people were within the Witts colony. So that's the population at the time of the Texas Revolution. Gonzales was composed of stores, of mechanics, and artisans. It was a central civic place for the colony. In 1831, the citizens were loaned a cannon for defense of Indians. And as we said, Indians at one time drove the settlers away. So the idea is the cannon was to give protection from the Indians. And Gonzales became the forward base for Anglo-Texas. So, although it's close to Behar, it's still widely considered an Anglo settlement. Now, the Federal Centralist conflict of 1835 is the backdrop for what happens. And during the summer of 1835, Texas was in an uproar. One of General Martin Perfecto de Cosa's couriers had been intercepted and the documents were opened and read. It made Cos furious and he demanded the arrest of those people responsible plus other troublemakers like William Bear Travis wanted them arrest. James Bowie wanted him arrested. Lorenzo de Zavala wanted him arrested. And in Texas, what they get from the dispatches of Coase is that the centralist government is planning a military operation against the colonists with the intent to either make them to submit to centralist rule or to push them out of Texas. Now, that's something that isn't stressed leading up to the Texas Revolution, but that's what the Texans were feared of. And what they were afraid of was Santa Ana turning Texas into another Zacatecas. The cannon becomes a rallying point because the centralists want to disarm the Texans. They've reduced the level of the militia for the states They've called in weapons, and they've come now for the cannon at Gonzales. You've got the first response by Gonzales, the turnout of the old 18, which included several members who would later lose their life at the Alamo. Now, they were quickly reinforced and if you ever wonder why they were quickly reinforced, it's because, again, of the state of Texas, of what's happening in Texas. The Texans had already turned out into the field before October 2nd. And what they were planning to do is intercept Coast when he landed on the coast. But that didn't happen. So where do these armed companies go after the battle at Gonzales? They go to Gonzales, and that's why they're there. So Gonzales becomes a communication hub in the Texas Revolution. As you saw, letters coming from Bejar go to Gonzales, go to San Felipe. Coming the other way from San Felipe and the colonies to Gonzales, Another thing about Gonzales is that it is the victim of an assault by Texas volunteers. And reading from uh, reading from something I, I wrote, uh, in November, a group of San Agustin volunteers ransacked Gonzales and when they passed through the town on their way to the front. Dr. Lancelot Smithers 
one of the few male residents left in town because others had gone to the siege, reported that the rowdy mob broke into houses and robbed all that they could lay their hands on. Shockingly, he said that the Aish Bayou men treated the women of this place worse than all the Comanche nation. He further contended that such insults were never offered to American women. And so if you wonder why Susanna Dickinson comes to Behar, it's because Gonzales became a dangerous place. But not so dangerous that life didn't still go on. And as I said, it becomes a marshalling point. So when volunteers are called for, the reason that the end location, the Immortal 32 can come to Travis's aid is because they are the closest. Others come to Gonzales, but not in time to relieve the Alamo. But the Gonzales 32 do answer Travis's call, make their way inside, and they're killed on the morning of March 6th. My point is today, we need to remember the Battle of Gonzales. We need to remember the Immortal 42, 32, but we also need to remember the role that the women, children, the community, the men of Gonzales played in the Texas Revolution. Afterwards, the troops that had gathered at Gonzales become the nucleus for Houston's army. And the town suffers its final insult when it is burned. I would now like to call upon those faithful men from Gonzales, the Immortal 32. I would now like to call upon those faithful men from Gonzales, the Immortal 32. I would now like to introduce Dr. Amy Jo Baker, a descendant of James, George, and William Deardorff, and a master educator. Company, order, on. Good morning, fellow Texans. I would like to preface my remarks by inviting each of you who are descendants or family members of the Immortal 32 to join our newly organized organization as charter members. The Immortal 32 Descendants and Family Association immediately following this program will be laying 32 yellow roses on the monument 
to the Immortal 32 on the grounds of the Alamo in the Convento Courtyard. And following that, we're having an organizational luncheon meeting today at the Minger Hotel. Although advanced reservations were requested and sold out, we do have room in the back for a few more to join us to see if they would like to uh, hear some of the historical presentations. Duty, honor, country. The words of Douglas MacArthur describing the courage, the character, and the fortitude of the American military throughout the history epitomized the Alamo defenders in general and the Immortal 32 in particular. I wanted to paraphrase some excerpts from the second most memorable military speech next to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, echoing what MacArthur described about the American soldier. The story of the Alamo and the men who fought here are the birthright of every American citizen some in their youth and all through their strength, their love and loyalty gave all that mortality can give. The Immortal 32 and the De Alamo Defenders, a band of brothers, need no eulogy from me or from any other man or woman. They have written their own history and written it red on the enemy's breast. But when I think of their patience under adversity, of their courage under fire, and their modesty in life. I am filled with an emotion and admiration I cannot put into words. They belong to history as furnishing one of the greatest examples of successful patriotism. Each of them belongs to posterity as the instructor of future generation in the principles of liberty and freedom. They belong to the present, to us, by their virtues and by their achievements. And to quote Governor Abbott, quote, the incredible acts of bravery demonstrated by the Alamo defenders were unmatched, none more so than the men known as the Immortal 32. In one of the most epic and inspiring instances of sacrifice in the defense of freedom during the Texas Revolution, 32 men from the Gonzales Ranging Company answered William Barrett Travis's eloquent plea for reinforcements. Through the promise of their love of freedom and the land they called home was stronger than any fear of the unwinnable battle. As the only relief force to arrive before the final assault, these courageous defenders willingly sacrificed their lives for the larger goal of freedom and did not do so in vain. Their ultimate sacrifice and the unyielding desire for independence propelled Texas to win its freedom and served as a catalyst for the establishment of our great nation of Texas today, our great state. In the final analysis, Jesus said, greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friends. And now I shall read the names of those brave men, the immortal 32. Isaac Baker, John Kane, George Washington Cottle, David Cummings, Jacob Darst, John Davis, Squire Damon, William Deirdreff, Charles Despierre, William Fishbaugh, John Flanders, Dolphin Ward Floyd, Galba Fuqua, John Garvin, John Gaston, James George, Thomas Jackson, John Kellogg, Andrew Kent, George Kimball, William King, Jonathan Lindley, Albert Martin, Jesse McCoy, Thomas Miller, Isaac Millsaps, George Nagin, Marcus Sewell, William Summers, George Tullison, Robert White, and Claiborne Wright. I would now ask for a moment of silence. Thank you. I now have the honor of introducing Marge Kassir, the president of the Gonzalez chapter of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. I am honored 
to participate in this remembrance of the men we are all so proud of. Thank you, Angela Wolfram, Director of Living History and Public Programs, who has organized this enjoyable educational event and invited Gonzales Chapter DRT to be a small part of it. Gonzales Chapter has 82 members who are descendants of the descendants of the Republic. Only 22 of those members have a Gonzales address. 11 of them don't even live in Texas. These daughters belong to the Gonzales Chapter because Gonzales is the home of their ancestors. 17 of our members are direct or collateral descendants of the nine men, of nine men among the immortal 32. I know there's some Gonzales chapter members in the audience. Let me see your hands. Are there daughters of other DRT cha chapters in the audience? How about, how many of you are descendants of one of the Immortal 32? Daughters or not? No one knows for sure how many men participated in the Battle of Gonzales when the first shot for Texas independence was fired. The 18 men who were in Gonzales when Mexican soldiers first demanded the return of the cannon sent out a plea for help. Men came from Bastrop, Rosario, San Felipe, and many other settlements to the east. Of the men with General Houston at the Battle of San, San Jacinto, some were from Gonzales. The Texian army was in Gonzales, headed for the Alamo, when Houston learned that they were too late. As he retreated to the east, men all along the way joined him. Brave men seeking independence fought at the Battle of Concepcion, the Battle of Bihar, and many other skirmishes. But the men who came to be known as the Immortal 32 were uniquely Gonzales residents. To be sure, some came from outlining areas farther up and down the Guadalupe River or over on the Laca River. But Gonzales was the capital of DeWitt's colony. It was the center of business, and politics and social life for these men and their families. After the first letter from Colonel Travis came, the Gonzales Ranging Company of Mounted Volunteers began to mobilize. When the second letter came, they gathered on the town square ready to go. Perhaps they remembered how grateful they were for the re reinforcements that flocked to Gonzales the previous fall. Perhaps they were confident that more brave Texians would join them at the Alamo. Gonzales was the westernmost Anglo settlement, closest to Bihar. Surely those farther east would be right behind them. Travis had written, victory or death. My fourth great uncle, William Philip King, as you saw in the skit this morning, was the youngest defender of the Alamo. He had taken his father's place in going with the mounted uh, volunteers. And I like to believe that he and the other men rode off <laughs> thinking that they would tip the scale toward victory. Colonel Travis sent another letter out on March 3rd. He wrote that a company of 32 men from Gonzales made their way into us on the morning of the 1st at 3 o'clock. He spoke of the courage which characterizes the patriot who is willing to die in defense of his country's liberty and his own honor. No, re no other reinforcements came, and the men at the Alamo all died from battle wounds or were executed. In the 186 years since her sons died at the Alamo, Gonzales has remembered and honored them in many ways. The memory of their sacrifice is still fresh. The Gonzales chapter, Daughters of the Republic of Texas, was organized in 1903 with a fervent vision of erecting a monument to the Immortal 32. Funds were raised for the monument that now stands in Cavento Courtyard. 
On anniversaries of the day the men left Gonzales, the Sons of the Republic of, Ch of Texas, Gonzales Chapter 29, places a wreath at the Centennial Monument to the Immortal 32 in front of the Gonzales Memorial Museum. The Crystal Theater Young Texians, whom you saw this morning, a troupe of young Gonzales performers, perform the Battle of the Immortal 32 at many events. Gonzales remembers and when the Alamo calls, Gonzalez still answers. Please welcome Gonzalez Mayor Connie Casillo. Good morning. Thank you to the Alamo Trust for allowing me the great privilege to pay tribute to Gonzalez's Alamo defenders, our immortal 32. From the office of the mayor and on behalf of the city of Gonzales, home to come and take it, it is an honor to participate in today's living history reenactment. Today's event serves as a thank you to the men who put Texas first, the men who rose up, and the men who fought for our freedom and died for our liberty. Today, let us unite to respect their honor and the legacy in giving us Texas. We stand on hollow ground as we honor the brave, courageous men of Gonzales, our men who entered these walls 186 years ago, where all patriots who yearned for freedom for a new opportunity, for a new life, a chance to live on some of the most beautiful lands they had ever seen. Land the most beautiful that they had ever laid eyes on. Land that they fought bands of Indians to receive land grants stamped, gone to Texas! No other account captures the essence of sacrifice more vividly than the story of Gonzales's immortal 32. Gonzales's 32 men forever immortalized as the only unit to answer Travis's letter, a letter pleading for reinforcements, a letter addressed to the people of Texas and all Americans in the world. Our force of 32 Militap from Texas, from Gonzales Ranging Company of the Mounted Volunteers, departed our town square at 2 p.m. on February the 27th. These men were husbands, fathers, and teenage sons who voluntarily organized to join the 150 Alamo defenders inside doomed to destruction. They resolved never to surrender. The youngest was Philip, was William Philip King, who took his father's place so he could look after his mother and others who were ill in his family. He argued with his father. Father, the family needs you much more than Colonel Travis needs you. Father, please let me go. Please, Father. Close your eyes. And can you imagine what really happened inside those walls? Can you feel the fear of our men as they saw thousands that encircled the Alamo and continued reinforcements arriving for Santa Ana? Our immortal 32 arrived at 3 a.m. on March the 1st, passing the enemy lines of Santa Ana's thousands and entering into these walls to never leave them again. Our defenders witnessed the blood of the red flag over Santa Ana's headquarters of San Fernando Cathedral 
the flag that signaled no quarter, meaning all soldiers would be slaughtered to their death. The blood that was yet to be shed by young boys along with the brave men who left their sweet wives and beautiful children to fight for their death for Texas. Susanna Dickinson told how young Galba Fuqua burst into the Alamo Chapel where she and her baby Angelina were hiding. And he tried to tell her something, but his jaws were so badly broken from the battle she couldn't understand a word the lad was saying. But he wasted no time to fight the Mexicans who were coming over those walls. May we forever remember the vision, the hope, and the faith, the brotherhood that these heroes shared. Let us prove that what unites us is not only our shared joys in this life, but what unites us is the shared grief over our past losses and the defeats that made us stronger. When you look at the Texas flag, know that it waves not only from the wind, but it waves from the last breath of that Texas soldier who died to give you Texas. My plea to the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, do not let our immortal 32 deaths ever be in vain. Never let the memory of our soldiers die and may their fight for victory or death never fade away. The blood of our men is forever mingled with the blood of Travis, Crockett, Bowie, and others. And it's their blood that waters the tree of liberty. It was their blood that bought you Texas and made you free! Travis said, the Lord is on our side. Travis, this one's for you. Remember the Alamo! And may God bless Gonzalez! God bless you! And God bless America! And forever remember the legacy to the call from Gonzalez. Come and take it! Woo! Now we will witness the arrival of the long awaited help, the weary soldiers who had no idea this would be the only brave group to answer the call for help. Soldiers, march on and meet your compatriots.
again, Gonzalez answers the call for A. Forever being recorded as the brave soldiers who put sacrifice before self. Thank you for attending our Immortal 32 ceremony. Thank you very much. You are welcome to come up and greet the Immortal 32 and take photographs. Immediately following the ceremony, there will be a brief program next to the Immortal 32 monument in the Convento Courtyard with a reading of the names and laying of flowers. Thank you for honoring the brave 32 men from Gonzales as we close out with the young Texan scene part of their song, The Immortal 32. I ask that you please remember Gonzales and remember the Alamo. Thank you very much. One, two, three, four. Hey, Kobe, can you hear it now? Uh, 
Uh, well, today we're, we're actually in the event on this That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> I know by now. <laughs> yeah. Good? Okay. If you didn't get it, Cheryl did for sure. Mom, do you want a photo? Yeah. Well, so I haven't seen any of the photos she's taken yet. Here we go. Let's go to the chapel. Let's go around. Hey, man. So there's another ceremony. Yeah, there'll be a flower laying ceremony right there. Thank you, sir. William Fishbuck. John Flanders. Dolphin Ward Floyd. 
Alba Foot Plus. John E. Garvin. John E. Gaston. James George. Thomas J. Jackson. John Benjamin Kellogg, second. Andrew Kent. George C. Kimball. King. Jonathan L. Lindy. Lindy, sorry. Thomas R. Miller. Isaac Millsaps. George Nagan. Marcus L. Sewell. William Summers. George W. Tumlinson. Richard White. Claiborne Wright. That's the 32. We're going to do the nine that were from Gonzalez, so we're already in the compound. Daniel Bourne, George Brown, Jerry C. Day, Emeron Dickinson, Andrew DeVault, John Harris, William Lightfoot, and Dr. Amos Puller. Thank you, everybody.